So we had a reading from Jeremiah today, and Jeremiah is one of the prophets from the uh, Hebrew Scripture. And one of the things we know about prophets is that nobody wants to be a prophet. Uh, for some reason, that schoolyard taunt came to me, you know, see ya, don't want to be ya, you know. We need our prophets, but we don't want to be one. No. There are many stories of prophetic calls in the scripture, like Jeremiah's, and they share a common pattern. God interrupts someone and issues marching orders. That's the first part of it. God interrupts someone and issues marching orders. The recipient resists. The recipient of the orders resists. God insists reassures. God empowers. And the person responds hopefully and eventually. Read about Jonah if you want to know what happens if you wait a long time. As I reflected on this pattern, I had a primary filled revelation. My dog Tabichi has a prophetic sensibility. Whenever I give her marching orders, she resists. <laughs> it's a source of great puzzlement to me that after seven and a half years, she has this impulse to resist when called. I've never heard of her. I've never even. She just resists. I don't know where she got it from. <laughs> a 17-year-old German girl called Vera Brandes walked onto the stage of the Cologne Opera House. The auditorium was empty. It was lit only by those little green exit signs. This was the most exciting day of Vera's life. She was the youngest concert promoter in Germany, 17 years old. And she persuaded the Cologne Opera House to do this late night uh, jazz concert with this American musician, Keith Jarrett. Anybody know Keith Jarrett? There you go, Barbara. Um, 1,400 people were coming. And in just a few hours, Jared would walk onto the same stage she was standing on. He'd sit down at the piano, and without rehearsal or sheet music, he would just begin to play this amazing jazz concert. But right now, Vera was introducing Keith to the piano in question, and it wasn't going very well. Jared looked to the instrument, a little bit wary of it, just from first glance. Played a few notes. Walked around it. Played a few notes. More. And muttered something to his producer. You feel the resistance <coughs> growing within you. Then the producer said to Vera, if you don't get a new piano, keep can't play. There had been a mistake, a rather large mistake. The opera house had provided the wrong piano, and this one had like um, this tiny harsh upper register because all the felt had been worn away on the piano hammers, I think it's called. Is that right? The black notes were sticking. The white notes were out of tune. The pedals didn't work. What were they thinking? And the piano itself was just too small to fill this whole opera house. It wouldn't create the volume you needed uh, to fill clear the back rows. So, not unlike a resistant prophet, Keith Jarrett left. Just left the place. He went outside and sat in his car, 
Hawaii, maybe. I don't know. You eat. And leave me here at Brandis to get on the phone to try to find a replacement piano. Now she could get a piano tuner, but she could not get a replacement piano. No one could get it there that fast. That, the concert was happening that night. And so she went outside and she stood there in the rain talking to Keith Jarrett, pleading with him not to cancel the concert. Who knows what words she used? Like nudging a stuck prophet. I imagine it had the right balance of insistence and encouragement. He looked out of his car window at this insistent, affirming young 17-year-old, bedraggled and rain-drenched, this teenager. Something in him melted. He said, Never forget, only for you. And a few hours later, Jarrett did indeed step out onto the stage of the Opera House. He sat down at the unplayable piano, and the concert began. Within moments, it became clear that something magical was happening. Jarrett was avoiding those Upper registers. This side. I should have practiced. You know, musicians need to practice. This way. Thank you. So he was, he was avoiding the upper registers. He was sticking to the middle tone of the keyboard, which gave the piece a soothing, ambient quality. But also, because the piano was so quiet, he had to set up these rumbling, repetitive riffs in the bass over here. And he stood up twisting and, and pirouetting on the keys and desperately trying to create enough music and enough volume to reach the people in the back room. It was an electrifying performance. It somehow um, has this peaceful quality. And at the same time, it is full of energy and dynamics. Peaceful. Full of energy. The audience loved it. Audiences continue to love it because the recording of the Cologne concert is the best selling piano album in history. And the best selling solo jazz album in history. Imagine it. It was sitting in the car. What a loss it would have been if Keith Jarrett's resistance had won out in that standoff. We resist for all kinds of reasons. And undoubtedly, there are times when resistance is a healthy and a necessary choice. Jarrett was probably afraid of a poor performance, such a large stage. It could hurt his career, at least his ego. In the face of barriers, God tells Jeremiah, fear not. When the fear of the unknown, the messy, the challenging, and the inconvenience is driving our resistance, when the fear of the unknown, the messy, the challenging, the inconvenient, when that is driving our resistance, we are in the perfect place to hear God's call to us. Because that's what happens, right? We resist, and God responds. Fear not. I am with you. I will empower you. Our resistance to being called, it's an entry point. It's an entry point. It's just not a stopping point. Our resistance to the Spirit's nudging can indicate a healthy, even holy tension 
For certainly the prophets were in a holy, healthy tension with God in their interactions. But it isn't the destination, it is the pathway. Brian Eno is famous, I have a musical theme today apparently, He's famous for rock and roll, uh, being a rock and roll guy, an ambient producer, and a catalyst for rock bands. Kind of get it going here, rock bands. He's worked with such bands like U2, Paul Simon, David Bowie, yes, Coldplay. And he has this technique for stimulating creativity in bands he works with. It's called the Oblique strategies. The oblique strategies. He has this pack of cards and he pulls them out, and the bands who know about this always resist. It's like a deck of cards. It has things on them with the big edge card. They hate, hate, hate these cards. They're designed to mix things up, to make things messy so the creative process can move forward. They say things like, to professional bands who are working on a piece, switch instruments and play the song again. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine the drummer? Um, I never learned the piano. Or can you imagine the person on key keyboards going, the guitar, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, some people cross, but it's say like the cards, you know, when you pick a card randomly, you realize if you just wrote the stuff on the list on the board, which you used to do, people just go down to the easiest one, and that's what they pick. Put them in control of the randomness of it, and what that kind of thing. So they say things like switch instruments and play the song, or find the one <laughs> troubling part of this song that's not working and accentuate it. Really go for it. Play that, play that mistake loud and clear like you mean it. Bands hated it. But after the bands resisted, they usually followed Brian's lead. They make a mess, and the positive result was consistent. Resistance is only a problem if that's our stopping point. Resistance is only one step. The band members trusted this co-creator. They gave him permission to shape up their well-worn patterns for making music. And from the chaotic and from the uncomfortable, from the out-of-the-box approach, creativity and new life musically emerged. So as Christians, we're called to live out of that box. You knew that was coming, didn't you? Yes. But our creative partner is far more ingenious and power-filled than Brian Eno. The Spirit of God, we're told, will interrupt us and give us marching orders. Because you know, we're modern day prophets, in case you didn't know that. Part of being a disciple. God's going to come in and interrupt us and give us some things to do and tell us what he wants us to go about or she wants us to go about. And, and then we are going to resist, most likely. There was one prophet that wasn't so resistant. It was it Isaiah? I think it was Isaiah. It wasn't quite as resistant as the rest. And the Spirit of Christ will insist will be ensure and empower us along with the body of Christ that we are part of. We're going to get interrupted. We're not going to like that so much. But as we see God provide and intervene in the midst of challenging, in the midst of the risky and the messy time and time again, our trust is built. Just like that guy who helped the musicians. He'd get everything messy so something creative could come out of it. But after so many times of it working, they're like, okay. And that's how we are with God. Following 
of God, living in the spirit of Christ, is not a well-defined, clean path. If you're living it authentically, you're probably going to feel some resistance. You're going to have to deal with that. But what happens in that creative space when God is remaking our path with us is amazing. It's new life. It's something that could not have been if we were just planning, 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 planning. I believe that our resistance as individuals, as dogs, hopefully, and community, I believe it will continue to melt as the evidence of God's presence empowers us to stretch further into the light of Christ. I think our resistance will melt as in our hearts we hear, <coughs> never forget, always be. May it be so. Amen.